Hi, I'm Jessalyn Cloudflare. Welcome. This is a warp troubleshooting video where you'll learn how to interpret warp DAG files. This is a more advanced episode, so if you come across any concepts you aren't fully familiar with, we also have a warp basics video that brings you up to speed. And as always, our support team will be here to help. Here's what we will go through. What are warp DAG files? How to download and navigate the warp DAG files? Warp status file? Warp settings file, daemon log file, and a few additional tips for analyzing them. Let's get started. So, what are warp DAG files? They contain valuable information about the device connection status, configuration, and warp locks. These files are your first line of defense when troubleshooting any issues. Each of these files serves different purposes and contains specific information, such as combination of logs and outputs created when warp dikes run. Now, where are the warp dike files? When warp is installed, a command line tool called warp dike is also installed. Simply running the command warp dike in a terminal will generate a zip file and place it on the user's desktop. Each time warp dike is run, a new set of logs will be generated. And now we can start by unzipping the file produced by warp dike and opening its content in a text editor. I'm using VS Code here, but any other text editor will also work. In this video, we'll only look at three particularly useful ones for initial troubleshooting. Warp status, warp settings, and daemon log. So now I'll walk you through each of these files and tell you why they're useful for initial troubleshooting. First, let's take a look at warp status. This file is straightforward. It contains the status of the client when warp diag was executed. The connection status is useful to know when you're analyzing any files that are outputs of common command line tools, such as listing interfaces, printing the routing table, and current DNS configuration. And that's it, on to warp settings. This file contains all of the currently active settings configured for the device, such as the modes and device profile. This file can help verify if the settings you're making in a dashboard are actually being applied locally. We should always check this file to see if there are any unexpected values. For example, let's say the user you're troubleshooting for is expected to have a specific device profile, like Office users meaning their devices should be connected to a corporate network. First, confirm that warp settings has the correct profile ID. If the profile ID is not the expected value, this might be an indication the user isn't matching the rules you've defined in your Cloudflare device profile settings. Also, if any specific changes have been made to the device profile settings, you can use this file to ensure the user is receiving those updates. For example, if you've updated a device profile to use the mask tunneling type instead of WireGuard, you can verify that the user has received that update and will indeed attempt to connect via mask. Daemon log is a very detailed file that contains everything going on in warp, such as the debug logs. But before we open the file, what is the warp daemon? It's the background process of warp also known as surface, depending on your operating system. When warp is installed, it's installed as both a daemon, the background process, and as a GUI, which is the interface you see here. The GUI, warp diag, and warp CLI can all communicate with the daemon. There are multiple daemon log files and they're named chronologically. Daemon log is the most recent and daemon three log is the oldest. Let's go over the file now, line by line. We'll look at how daemon log should look like when warp connects as expected. When warp starts, it prints out its version information, so we'll start there. Search for the string warp underscore service colon version colon and look for the most recent entry. That should be your current session. Our team is optimizing warp die constantly, so the string we mentioned in this video might change slightly in the future. The registration contains all the necessary information to connect the warp client, which is stored securely on the machine. If the GUI detects a missing registration, it may attempt to obtain one if configured to do so. Otherwise, it'll display missing registration. Once the registration is loaded, 
Warp will attempt to connect, but only if configured to do so automatically. Otherwise, it will only attempt to connect if it was previously connected. After registration, Warp will then retrieve the device profile remotely via an API. This includes the device configurations and mode that will be used. It's very important to be aware that the device profile can be further influenced by a local configuration file, which is used by an MDM provider such as Intune or Kanji. For more information on Cloudflare MDM configuration, you can refer to our documentation. At this point, which components connect is determined by the mode. If the mode contains the tunnel component, for example, secure web gateway without DNS filtering, we'll see initiate warp. If the mode contains the DNS component, like gateway with DOH, we'll see initiate DNS. If it contains both, like gateway with warp, we'll eventually see both. Let's now review each. Starting with initiate warp for modes with the tunnel component. The tunnel component includes a firewall. It starts off by allowing the tunnel endpoint through the firewall and attempting to connect it. When connecting the tunnel, Warp attempts to connect to both IPv4 and IPv6 at the same time. This makes sure the end user will be connected as fast as possible. And this process is called happy eyeballs. Once connected, a network interface is created, and it begins the task of updating the routing table and the firewall according to the exclude or include split tunnel entries. Those entries can be either domains or IPs. Warp will update the routing table immediately for any IPs, but for domains, it will rely on the DNS resolution for these domains and will update the routing table upon completion. Once that's completed, Warp performs two connectivity tests, one in the tunnel and one out of the tunnel. Moving on to initiate DNS, and this is for modes with DNS component. For DNS, Warp will set itself as the default DNS global provider and forward all DNS requests to Cloudflare via DNS over HTTPS, or DOH. And in order to do that, the following sequence needs to complete successfully. First, attempt to connect to the DOH endpoint. Second, receive a DNS response from that DOH endpoint. Third, bind to a localhost on 127.0.2.2 and 023. Fourth, Update the system to use these IPs as the DNS provider. If all four steps happen without error, Warp then performs a series of DNS connectivity checks. These are end-to-end -end tests which confirm that Warp is successfully receiving DNS requests, forwarding them to Cloudflare for resolution, and receiving a valid response. Here are some additional tips to make troubleshooting easier. You should use the search function in your text editor to quickly locate terms like error, DNS, or disconnected. Also look for patterns, such as repeated entries. These can point to specific issues. And finally, cross-referencing files from warp settings, warp status, and daemon log can reveal insights and a bigger picture. For example, if warp status shows disconnected, check daemon log for error details and warp settings for potential misconfigurations. There are other files that provide more specific information depending on your issue. Our team is optimizing Warp Diet constantly, so you might find more files in the future. For an updated view on what you can find in which file, check out our troubleshooting guide. In our next videos, we'll dive into the top three common issues users face. If you're still experiencing issues after following these steps, don't hesitate to reach out to our support team. We're always here to help. Thanks for watching and see you soon.